will have the first uh, talk today by Jeffrey uh, Townsend from uh, the Yale School of Public Health. So we are looking for, uh, very much forward to your talk and uh, please start. Thank you for uh, the introduction and for the invitation to speak to this group. Uh, I'm going to talk today about what I call the effect sizes of somatic mutations. And uh, this is work that I've done with uh, Vincent Canataro, who's probably the first author of all the work I'm going to talk about today, and uh, also the help of Stephen Gaffney in my group. So I think probably everyone in this audience is familiar with the typical way that uh, driver genes have been identified in many studies um, over the past eight, nine, or 10 years where we've done enormous amounts of tumor sequencing and tried to understand which genes were responsible for the occurrence of cancer. And uh, a typical kind of figure you might see on this topic uh, would be this one. This is from uh, Lawrence et al.'s well-known paper in 2014. And what they did was to investigate driver genes in a large genomic analysis of lots of different tumor samples. Nowadays, the numbers are even bigger, but these are you know, 200, 400 samples each, looking at myeloid leukemia, bladder cancer, colorectal, endometrial, head and neck cancer, lung adenocarcinoma, lung squamous carcinoma, and in this figure, which is fairly typical, what they've done is just listed all of the driver genes that they were able to detect statistically significant enrichment of mutations in over what's expected based on uh, synonymous sites or the equivalent. And what they've done is list them ranked by p-value and by prevalence. So p-value is the x-axis, so these are very significant, the ones on the far left, and these are less significant on the far right. And then they've also indicated the prevalence of the mutations, that is how many mutations you actually see. If you just count across the patients, how often is that mutation seen in those patients? So it's two ways of looking at the data. The prevalence is shown by these lollipops. Uh, if you have a big red dot, that means over 10% are mutated. Orange is five to 10%. Green, three to 5%. Blue, two to 3%. So uh, this is all great information and incredibly important to what we wanna do in cancer because it's very important that we identify the genes that uh, are responsible for cancer. And it's also important that we understand how frequently those genes are mutated because that tells us things about like how likely it is to be you know, helpful to the population if we design a drug targeting one of these genes. But there's a number of problems with these, this way of showing the data. And the main problem is that what you do here, and this is purely implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly when I read this chart or other people read this chart, I might take p-value as an indicator of how important these genes are in cancer, in terms of how important they are in terms of like actually making an individual patient have cancer. And that would be problematic for a list of reasons I'm gonna tell you in a moment, or I might take the prevalence as an indication of how important these genes are for an individual who's got cancer. And that would also be incorrect. So I think we should probably report things a little differently. Now I'm just gonna focus on one example right here so you can actually see some of them because I'm gonna come up with some data on this in a moment. But so if I just blow up, sorry, colorectal, um, what you can see is we have APC at the top, P P53 at the top, uh, FBOX W7, SMAD4 and NRAS. Down here we have BRAF, KRAS, PI3 kinase. So there's an implicit order here. We're gonna come back to that. So I just wanted to blow that up to show you. Um, but here are the problems with this. Uh, P-values, 
which are very important in science, are thresholds for belief in contrast to a null hypothesis. Uh, they're subject to both experimentally controllable and experimentally uncontrollable issues of sample size. And this does apply in cancer because the sample size is not just determined by the count of patients, it's also determined by the count of mutations. So a gene is either detected or not, not just because it has high, high uh, um, not just because of the number of patients you look at, but whether or not that gene gets mutated very frequently. And I'll show you a lot of data about that in a moment. Uh, secondly, p-values are not metrics of effect. Uh, so there's a lot of, I've just put some citations in here. There's a ton of papers in the statistics field about these kinds of comments. I, I like to say the, their frequent misuse as metrics of effect have often and ineffectively been vociferously decried. So anytime you have a p-value, pretty much, you should report an effect size. That's not been done for 10 years for TCJ studies and ICGRC studies, all the studies that have been done. So uh, this is true that, that, um, that uh, this sort of, this is sort of a, is considered a statistical error by picayune biostatisticians like me, even in cases when the only attributable mistake is omission of effect size. And there's a good reason for that. Everyone's familiar with this, so especially with large genomic data sets. It's easy to get, for instance, a really, really strong p-value for a regression with almost no effect size that is completely irrelevant. So if you don't report the effect size, you can really, you know, convey something that's misleading. And that's true with cancer genes as well. Okay. So to quantify cancer effect size, we need to deconvolute prevalence, or deconvolve it, I guess, is, into two things. The baseline mutation rate, how often do actual bases in cancer cells actually get mutated, and the degree of selection for that mutation in the cancer lineage. So how do we do this? Uh, this is just a little classic evolutionary diagram. I think probably most people here are familiar with how evolution works, but I like to show this especially for my medical audiences. Uh, you have an initial cell, the way sort of evolution occurs is you, you have mutation introducing variants, you have selection eliminating variants, and having other, you know, creating the situation where the others reproduce more, and then you have uh, further selection and further mutation, and so the point is that the prevalence in a population of a variant depends jointly on the degree of mutation and the degree of selection. So we want to deconvolute that. We want to deal with the fact that mutation creates variation. Unfavorable mutations are selected against. Reproduction and mutation occur. Favorable mutations are more likely to survive and reproduce. Okay. So if we can get a selection coefficient, I just want to sort of introduce the broad scope here. What does a selection coefficient or selection intensity for a cancer mean? Well, essentially it means uh, the degree to which uh, a mutation affects all of the classic hallmarks of, uh, that Hannafin and Weinberg are famous for denoting <laughs> of, of cancer, with one exception, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I'd be happy to chat in general, which is genome instability and mutation. That's because that actually is the source of mutation, and so that's a different thing from the selection coefficient. So, so there's sort of a, I think that, the, that in this diagram, this has a very special status that needs to be kept in mind. So it's a composite. You know, whatever, whatever that mutation is doing to all of these things, the selection coefficient or selection intensity or effect size uh, is a composite of what that does to the cancer lineage in terms of aiding its survival or reproduction. Okay, so how can we do this? We can make a set of assumptions and calculate selective effect. And here's what we do. We say the selection intensities for particular amino acid substitutions can be estimated by comparing the actual flux of somatic variant substitutions across multiple tumors. We get at that via the prevalence. That's what we actually see. We see substitutions across things. And uh, compare that to the flux of substitutions expected to occur by mutation and fixation in the absence of selection. And I'm not going to quite go through the population genetics here, but I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it if they're interested. 
but all you need to do to the, do this comparison is, let me just sort of give you the overview view. So for instance, if you have uh, KRAS G12C and you have three out of six tumors mutated in it, and then odorant receptor 2L13, uh, and three out of six tumors are mutated in that, the prevalence is the same, uh, but perhaps there's a difference in selection, and the way you'd know it is by looking at what you'd expect to occur. And if you expect none in G12C, because the mutation rate is lower, for instance, than odorant receptor 2L13, uh, but you expect the three in that one, then you'd have a high selection coefficient for G12C. Okay, I think you guys get the idea. So how can we do this? Here's the, the method slide. You can calculate the mutation rate at every site in the genome. And you do it by calculating, uh, by convolving the gene-based rates from silent sites. So you can use MUTSIG CV or DNDS CV, which are both approaches that allow you to do this. You have to hack them a little bit to get the answer out. But if you use those approaches, you can calculate the gene-based mutation rate. And then once you have that gene-based mutation rate, every gene in the genome has a mutation rate. It varies over a large scale. This is lung adenocarcinoma, in case you're curious, but I want you to just pay attention. This is, you know, uh, two orders of magnitude from 10 to the two to the 10 to the negative four. Very big differences in gene by gene mutation rate. Um, just to give you a little preview, if you have a very big difference in mutation rate, what does that mean about the selection intensity you're gonna infer based on the prevalence? It's probably gonna have a big effect. So, you take that gene-based mutation rate, and then you look at the trinucleotide signatures. There's a number of ways of getting these. They were talked about uh, yesterday by a couple of our speakers. Nikki talked about them. And uh, so once you get those uh, trinucleotide base rates, you can convolve them with the gene-based rates to get an estimate for every single site within every single gene. It's not a unique one for every site and every gene because the same site with the same context in the gene is gonna have the same value, but essentially you're getting a good estimate of the mutation rate for that site. Then you can just uh, make sort of one of these matrices of the particular mutations at the particular sites and look at how frequently you expect to get those mutations at those sites. Now remember this, I'm gonna come back to this, in a, this matrix in a moment, but this is just the mutation matrix. This is what we expect to happen. And you might note there are a lot of white spots. Those are because you can't get that amino acid by a single mutation change, um, but there are a bunch of changes that can happen. Okay, so let me just ask one question to motivate this a little bit. Uh, what do you think the relationship between mutation rate and the recurrent substitution frequency in colon adenocarcinoma is. And I could have put any cancer in the 21 cancers or 23 cancers that you can do this analysis on up there and it would give you the same result. What, this is the mutation rate on the x-axis and this is the frequency that we see substitutions or in other words, the prevalence of the mutations. This is just the distribution this is the, what's the relationship, in other words, I'm looking for a sort of a correlation analysis between mutation rate and recurrent substitution frequency. So any substitution that is recurrent, that happens more than once in a patient population. It's what I would think too at first. It's not at all. You've got a bunch of genes that are mutated at basically baseline mutation rate and then you've got a ton of genes that are way, way more frequent than expected. And that's, what's the reason for that? It's natural selection. It's because the cancer lineage is actually, you know, aided and abetted by these mutations in reproducing and growing in high, to high prevalence. So, so there has to be this difference between, you know, the prevalence that we see and the mutation rate. And, and that calculation should give us that selection Effect. And so essentially all you have to do then is look at this mutation matrix and then you look at what you actually see and you can see it's incredibly depauperate compared to the mutations that are expected. So, you know, all of these mutations that are at high frequency uh, are highly selected. So this is our selection matrix. We're just looking at uh, how much more frequent these mutations are in the observed data compared to the expected data. And there's a, you can break this down essentially, I don't have the math here because I don't, it's not good for presentations, but it's a pretty simple calculation that it just, there's a selection intensity that is the, 
multiplication of the effective population size times the uh, selection coefficient is equal to the prevalence and then you just deconvolve it and you get everything. So um, I can talk about that in detail if anyone wants in person. But uh, so let's take a look at some cancers. So the prevalence of substitutions in lung adenocarcinoma can be deconvolved into mutation rate and select intensity. So what I want to show you here is I, I want you to first just focus on these numbers. These are the prevalences, sorry it isn't labeled there, but these numbers are how many patients had each of these very specific mutations. And what you can see is there's higher numbers up here and lower numbers up here generally, but not entirely. And then what I've done here is I'm showing you the mutation rate off to the left as a bar chart. And over here I'm showing you the selection intensity that we infer based on the prevalence and the mutation rate. And the thing that I want to sort of show you is that there are some very different mutation rates here, uh, some fairly different prevalences here, and they end up sort of multiplying together. And in this particular case, you know, these actually, I don't have the error bars because it looks really messy if I show you the error bars, but um, these are all fairly equivalent levels of selection on these G12 sites, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later. But this orientation, this lung adenocarcinoma, this ranked list, is different from what you find if you rank them by p-value, and it's different from what you find if you rank them by prevalence. And I think that's kind of important because basically we should be aiming our priorities of basic research, clinical trial design, uh, um, drug targeting on the basis of this, not on the basis of p-value, and not on the basis of, well, somewhat on the basis of prevalence, because you also want a drug that treats a lot of people. Okay, so uh, I, the second point I just want to make about the same chart is that a number of the low frequency mutations exhibit high effect size. So if you look down here, uh, KRAS Q61L, actually well known that this is a cancer related gene, but it's only present at pres prevalence three. But its mutation rate is also really low, so its selection coefficient is fairly high. By the way, by the way these are all high selection coefficients. These just ones are just really, really high. So none of these are low selection coefficients. But a good example is catenin B1, uh, you know, only present in four. Uh, people know why catenins are important to cancer. Um, and it's got a high, these are all high selection coefficients, but these are really high. Uh, so uh, BRAF N581S, another well-known cancer gene, uh, pretty important. Uh, number of EGFRs, P53 starts coming up here. We get a MAP kinase. So this list is kind of important to look at. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for colon adenocarcinoma. So here's a BRAF V600E, well known, high prevalence gene, very high selection intensity. KRAS also at high selection intensity, P53. Uh, this is a non coding SNV, which is at prevalence 3, very high selection intensity. Kind of an interesting candidate to look at. Yes? Up, right, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so are these mutation rates per uh, gene per replication? Per what? Per gene per replication. Uh, the mutation rates are per, uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so what is the unit of the mutation rate here? Uh, this mutation rate, uh, what is the unit, what is the unit? I'm going to have to get back to you on what the okay, unit yeah. is. It's not, it's not based on a molecular mm -hmm. rate though. It's based on the rate, it's, it's essentially per, it's essentially per tumorigenous cyst to resection. Um, but that, if, the reason I hesitate to say that is that doesn't make sense for why it's quite so low. Um, so it's, it's basically a scaled per, uh -huh. per tumor genesis to resection. And, and I'm not sure exactly why it's scaled. Okay. I'd have to get back to you. But, uh, Sorry? It must be per base pair per tumor. It must be per base pair per tumor, right? Um, this is, it's actually per, in the, in the case of the amino acids, it's per amino acid change, right? So it's the, because you're only, these are for every amino acid change. In the case of this non-coding SNV, the mutation rate is per nucleotide, because it's a non-coding site, so we can only look at the nucleotide rate. Um, 
but that's all taken into account. So this is selection intensity is appropriately scaled even though that because that mutation rate is, you know, that's uh, the right so, mutation. So um, re regardless of the units, um, you had another plot on one of the previous slides where you show the scatter plot of uh, different genes with different mutation rates and the mutation rates there were much higher. Uh, the, I think that the limit, the upper limit was something like 10 to the minus two. Why was that? Um, if you go, these are go. really good questions. I, I don't know the answer. Okay. I'm sure that there's a good reason for it. Uh, why was that 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus four and then this one? Okay, maybe we can discuss later, sorry. I, I don't know, I'd have okay, to look thanks. into how we made that plot, but sorry. It's a good question. Uh, so, um, the point is that there are quite a few low prevalence mutations. Now, I, I wanna make sure I spell out the caveat here. I'm not, none of these am I claiming is a statistically significantly mutated gene, right? All I'm claiming is that you can actually look at what the expected effect size is of them, but that's an important point. So these are all candidates that may not, may or may not be, you know, with, with just a prevalence of two in a sample of say 200 or something, I wouldn't, you know, bank my money on the fact that these are necessarily drivers. Uh, I just wanna point out that there are drivers with very high effect size, that if any of them are drivers with high effect size for an individual patient, these would be very, very important mutations that if you had a targeted way to treat them, it would make a big difference to their, to their, um, to their cancer treatment. Okay, uh, so what kinds of questions, I'm just gonna give a couple examples of things that we can address with this approach, uh, and there's many things you can address with the approach, but uh, diverse mutations of KRAS G12 have been associated with pancreatic, lung, and colorectal adenocarcinomas. So here are just plots of the frequency with which you get certain amino acids at the G12 site mutated in pancreas, can, pancreatic can, adenocarcinoma, colon adenocarcinoma, and lung adenocarcinoma. And the interesting thing is that you get very different distributions of the amino acids at the different, in the different tumor types. So one of the questions that people have asked quite frequently is, are those different different distributions because the amino acid state matters to those cancers? Or are those different distributions just a byproduct of mutation? And there's some reason, people have, there's people that reason to believe it's maybe mutation because the changes that underlie the cysteine, for instance, in lung cancer are known to be more frequent than uh, in lung cancer than others because of the influence of smoking on the trinucleotide mutation rates. So we can answer that question pretty directly with this approach. So for instance, here we look, here are the four KRAS G12 sites in lung adenocarcinoma, um, some very different mutation rates, but when you put them together, you get fairly similarly very high selection coefficients. And again, uh, the error bars on this are enough that I'm not sure if I would put a lot of confidence in the differences between these four. They're all very high. Um, and KRAS G13 appears to have a slightly lower selection coefficient, but that's, uh, that fits actually with molecular data on cell line analysis and KRAS Q61 also has a slightly lower selection coefficient. Uh, and then you can look at the same thing in colon adenocarcinoma, and again, we find that uh, you know, three out of four anyway have the same. It's interesting that G12C looks a bit lower here, so maybe there's something to that in colon adenocarcinoma, or maybe it's just an artifact of the fact that we only have nine samples here, and the error bars are, are enough that it, it isn't different. But in general, I would say this analysis very much supports the idea that the basis is, is on mutation and not about the actual function of that, which fits very well with the biochemical data, which for the most part says that it doesn't matter what amino acid you substitute in there, it changes the function of the gene in exactly the same way. Okay, uh, another question that has come up is uh, major drivers, um, it has been remarked, are not the same between HPV minus and HPV plus head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. If uh, your squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck arises because of an HPV infection, or if it arises not because of some other reason, uh, there's been a lot of argument that those are pretty different diseases because the prevalences are different. But it could be that maybe HPV affects mutation rate, uh, could be they have the same, uh, 
genetic basis, but we really need to deconvolve these two to figure out the answer. So we can, uh, this is the prevalence in HPV plus, this is the prevalence in HPV minus, and I'm gonna come back to this, but most of the genes lie on these axes. In other words, they're mutated in HPV plus or they're mutated in HPV minus at high levels, um, but not both, with the exception of these four different uh, changes, which you do see in both, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So let's just do this deconvolution. Uh, first, let's ask, uh, are the trinucleotide mutation rates different between these two? And it turns out they're not. They're pretty much identical. So it doesn't look like it's a mutation here. Next, we can ask, are the genic mutation rates different? And it turns out they are. So gene by gene, you get very different mutation rates between these two. It may be because of the hijacking of the transcriptional apparatus by the HPV which changes the amount of transcription of all the genes and that changes transcription enabled repair which changes mutation rates. I'm not sure, I'm just speculating here. But the gene by gene rates are very different. Now, that doesn't answer the question exactly because the real question is, is there a selective difference between the mutations that we observe in the two? And the answer is yes. So on the left you see HPV minus head and neck squamous cell carcinoma almost all the highly selected mutations are p53 with the exception of a few other sites um, and then in hpv plus head and neck squamous cell carcinoma there are a sort of smattering of different more causative i would say mutations although even those are at fairly low frequency um, and the only one that's at really high selection intensity is this FBOX W7, which can be found at fairly high selection intensity in both kinds of cancers. And those are those four ones that I mentioned earlier. I've just plotted them. There are a lot on these axes. I, it just turns out to be a messy plot if I show you that. But um, the point is that all of these, that these four, in my view, are, uh, are kind of interesting because they represent the common regulatory basis for cancer of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma between the two types, whereas there's a lot of genes other than those two that are only found in one type or in the other in terms of their selection intensity. So there's very different genetic basis of these with the exception of sort of a core relationship with PI3 kinase, MAPK, and this FBOX W7 gene, which, uh, which has a very, very high selection intensity, even though it's got a very, very low, uh, low, um, prevalence. So this is another example of one, and this is one where I, where the un molecular data underlying its function is sort of fairly well known. So I would say with some confidence that this gene is actually very, very important to those individuals who have it mutated. And uh, if there were some way to help them specifically with that target, it would make a big difference to their, uh, their uh, prognosis. Um, I'm just going to give you one more sort of hint forward is one of the things that we're starting to look at a lot more now is if you actually take all of those different mutations and look at what the selection intensity of them are and the underlying mutational causes, you can then ask questions about the net selection intensity imposed by a particular mutation source. So for instance, in this particular case, uh, we're looking at the mutation process of Apobec and non-Apobec. Apobec is a, um, it's a virally induced uh, protection mechanism within the cell. It causes mutations. It's meant to cause mutations to viral sequences, but it also causes mutations to your own chromosomes when it's activated as sort of a byproduct, so it's a double-edged sword. Uh, but the point is that when that process is present, and it's present in a number of cancers, but especially the virally induced cancers, uh, yes? Uh, so the way we find out whether it's the mutation process of apobec or non-apobec is from the trinucleotide signatures, which you can deconvolve into uh, sort of a, a signature of selection. And, and the, so there's a cosmic signature for apobec um, uh, versus other processes. So that allows us to know whether the mutations are caused by, uh, by apobec or by non-apobec processes, at least in a probabilistic sense, because they're far more likely in one way or another way. So. Yeah, this is still head and neck. Yeah. Uh, so the point is that we can just sort of uh, do a, it's a, we just make a, it's a product calculation. So you multiply the prevalence of the mutation, because that's important in this question, like how much, 
how much of that mutation is there by the selection intensity and by the mutation rates to try to understand what the net realized selection intensity on each mutation is. So the mutation could appear in both sides of this is one thing I want to just be clear about because because if you had a mutation that could be created by apobec or non apobec processes, which almost all of them can, it's going to appear in both. But the point is, what's the selection of coefficient for those? And and uh, what you what you see here is that there's actually a higher net selection intensity for non apobec processes compared to apobec processes. This is not the best graph to demonstrate that, but it, but it's true. Um, and the so the inference that you'd make, and this is sort of a very hypothetical inference because you can't. There's no way to make this happen exactly, but is that you would prefer to actually switch to have an apobec mutation from a non apobec mutation if you could. <laughs> Just a little thought process you could sort of think about there. Because generally speaking, the non apobec mutations have higher selection intensity than the apobec mutations. Yes, Nikki. Um, yes, you could. I guess my opinion is that the important thing is the single sites and that we actually mislead ourselves when quantifying these things by gene. Um, biochemically, you know, a gene has, you know, every amino acid has its own specific function and there's no reason to do this gene-based way of thinking about it, like is a gene important or is a gene not important? It really should just be, we should be asking about the sites. And in cancer, we have the unique opportunity to do that. So in evolutionary biology for years, we've not really done that and the reason is we don't really have a way of calculating site by site mutation rates. But we can do it in cancer, which is extraordinary. And that allows us to actually get this kind of acuity on a site by site basis for what the selection intensity is. Um, so it's very exciting to me that we're able to do that just from an evolutionary biology standpoint alone. But I also think that we mislead ourselves sort of like categorizing a gene as a, you know, there's no reason to, like for instance, it's obvious, right, that the KRAS G12 site has more in common with the NRAS G12 site than it does with any other site in KRAS. So why are we thinking about the gene? I, I don't really understand why we should. We should just think about the sites. So I agree with all those hotspot analyses and stuff like that. And, I don't have the result here, but we also looked at the correlation between the previous hotspot analyses. So just for everyone's context, there have been some papers that have come out, not, deconvolut not, not deconvolving like I've done here, but where they just look at individual sites and ask is there a significantly enriched level of mutation in individual sites. And this analysis coincides very nicely with those analyses in terms of the selection intensities for hotspot identified sites are much higher than the ones for not identified sites. Yeah. Right. So near the site, the site wouldn't matter if it's a tumor suppressor. Absolutely, but you might remember that I had tumor suppressor genes on there. So how does that work? Um, well, on my, you know, my selection, like they appear because those mutations have an important selective effect, like mutations in p53 well, you had a, you had a few of them right but presumably there were there were more that you didn't show like there were there was maybe one or two truncating mutations that you showed but you know across the tumor suppressor gene in some of these cohorts aren't there more truncating mutations that are just distributed throughout the gene uh, there are lots of truncated mutations they tend to be well i don't know if they tend to be less uh, you know they the one thing that shows up clearly when you do this analysis is relative to just asking about p values which I hope we can all agree is not the way to do it. Um, oncogenes end up elevated in their importance compared to tumor suppressors. And the reason for that is that oncogenes only have that single site that can get hit. It has a, that's a small target size and a smaller net mutation rate across the gene. And so oncogenes tend to be, uh, you know, to, there's less mutational input, so you have less prevalence. So the p value is not as extreme for oncogenes but the selection coefficient maybe is. And so, but to answer your question, um, it still turns out that, I mean, when I show those plots, I'm showing like the top selected mutations. There's lots more. I mean, that list goes down 100, maybe even 200 sites, you know, so. Um, and they're all, all the tumor suppressors that people identify with p-values come out as having, you know, significant selective effects of those mutations. But yeah, compared to what our mental picture of tumor suppressors versus oncogenes and their significance is, this, are, this method tends to push the 
tumor suppressors down compared to the oncogenes, but just relative to what we are used to. But that's, to me, that's very much aligned with my argument at the beginning of this, uh, this uh, talk, which is that we, <laughs> we need to change how we think about these things because when you line them up by p-value, you start, you see a pattern that's different from the reality. Now, there's one other thing I can add that is not, you didn't ask this question, but maybe underlying your thoughts is this question. So, um, you, you know, one reason you might want to look gene-wide is because the way we're essentially calculating the selection coefficient, we're, we're saying, okay, here's the initiation of the, of the tumor, and then here's resection. And there's this time period going along. And we're asking, you know, how likely is it we're gonna get a mutation along this, along this trajectory? Now, in a tumor suppressor like P53, it's a really good example, if you get one mutation in P53, you almost never get another mutation in P53. What that means is your observed prevalence of mutations, of other mutations, is gonna be, of all mutations, is gonna be lowered by the fact that you might get a different mutation and that mutation won't be observed in that case. So we take that into account, is all I have to say. So my point is taking that into account actually makes a difference because you have to pay attention to what the select, like in, in estimating the selection intensity, you can't ask, this is getting into a lot of the details that I don't know if I want to spend too much time on, but you can't ask the question without taking into account the fact that when you disable the gene, you no longer have a selection coefficient for another disabling mutation. So my point is just that in those estimates I've given you, that is taken into account. Carla. Um, I have not done that analysis. It would be very straightforward for me to do that analysis. I could do it very quickly. Um, and I will say that what I think the answer is, is that yes, the selection coefficients are different and there's probably a high selection coefficient for notch. Um, and that's a great sort of like, not exactly a caveat, but a sort of like, what I've done here is the, you know, most straightforward, easy thing to do, which is to look at initiation of the primary tumor to resection and ask what the selection coefficient is. But that's the average selection coefficient over that time period. The same analysis can be done by breaking down into any sort of developmental time slice that you want. You can put it on your phylogenetic tree, map the mutations to a particular branch on the tree and do this analysis. There's a tremendous flexibility about how we do it. Of course, anytime you do that, it tends to reduce your sample size and you need a big sample size for this analysis. Um, you know, those, all those twos, like if we could just get a bigger sample size, we would know whether those are real or not real, right? And, and that's actually my last point that I'll make with my slides. Um, well, first, just that we've done this for all, you know, you can, actually this is the very point, we were just saying, like, uh, selective advantage to cancer can be calculated for any sufficiently large subset of tumors, whether you wanna classify it by cancer type, so here we've done it to 20 different um, cancer types, or you wanna, do a developmental subset, or if you want to break it into uh, ER positive and ER negative breast cancer, or MSI negative or MSI positive uh, colon cancer and stuff like that. And so there's all kinds of ways you can break it up. And you can do this analysis on any breakup, and it does change the results somewhat depending on what you're doing. Uh, just because I mentioned that example, for the breast cancer example, ER positive and ER negative have very different distributions of selection coefficients. And that makes some sense because that's a very biological difference, the ER positive and ER negative thing. Uh, if you look at microsatellite instability though, you get exactly, you, you separate, separate colon cancer where it has microsatellite instability and microsatellite non-instability, uh, you get the same selection coefficients between the two analyses. And that makes sense because that's basically just a mutational process difference. So deconvolve the mutations, selection intensity ends up the same. Yeah. Of questions, and just a, a quick one related to what Ben was asking uh, on the issue of, of the gene level as well as the oncogene tumor suppressor. Have you looked at or can you look at CNAs with this technique? Uh, um, I'm going to get back to your question, okay? 
often we care about selection after you already have a few mutations. Full sizes to do that kind of analysis? Uh, for some cancers, we do. For breast cancer, for instance, we, I have the sample sizes, like, I don't know, I as in like I have gathered the sample sizes, I don't know <laughs> what that means, uh, that are big enough. You need something like, you know, 500 at a minimum, maybe 1,000 tumors to really do a good epistasis analysis. Um, but yeah, we have that for some tumors, for breast cancer, for um, lung cancers, there's around 600 or so, so we can probably do it for, for a bunch of those. And we have an approach to do that, I'm not ready to present it, but we, we have done that. And, you know, the long and the short is that we can do the entire, like, evolutionary landscape of these things based on the selection coefficients moving from one spot to another, to another, to another. So we have it all happening, uh, but I'm not ready to present. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, selective adventure which can be calculated for any sufficiently large subset of tumors, and the point that I wanted to get to, and I'll get back to your question about CNBs. Um, this is a recent paper by Armenia et al., Nature Genetics, probably many of you know it, it was called The Long Tail of Drivers in Prostate Cancer, and their point was that, uh, the, that by doing a large study of 1,000 prostate cancers, they found a lot of new drivers, and I think that can only be re-emphasized. <laughs> I would say that's absolutely true, and it, it's even, even worse than that, or even better than that, depending upon your sort of perspective here, because if you take that data, which we've now done, uh, we took all the thousand tumors and uh, reanalyzed that data via our pipeline. And um, this, by the way, is they, they order these by prevalence, which as I said before, is not really the importance to cancer. It is sort of, if you're wondering what their, your drug targeting population would be, that's an important measure, but it's not the importance to cancer. So P53 is at the top here, but it's not the most selected gene. Here's SPOP. Here's KM2C, 2D. If we do the selection coefficient analysis, um, what we find is a very different distribution of where those genes fall on that plot. In fact, all of these ones that are black are selection intensities of genes that are not statistically, well, actually, all the ones that don't have stars are here, are ones that are not statistically significant in that thousand tumor study. And the thing I want you to pay attention to is that the three highest estimated selection intensity mutations are not significant yet. So a thousand is not enough. We need to sequence lots and lots of tumors to understand whether or not these are actually drivers. And if they are drivers, they have the potential to be incredibly important drivers for those few patients who possess those mutations. Um, and some of them are, you know, widely known cancer genes like catenin D2, uh, very high selection coefficient in prostate cancer. However, it's not significant because only a few patients actually have that mutation, partly because the mutation rate is really low. So it just doesn't happen very frequently. Uh, VEGFB, uh, NOS2, interesting one where we have uh, a splice site mutation over here that's the most highly high selected effect across the entire prostate cancer data. Uh, we've got a splice site mutation and uh, another mutation in NOS2. So, uh, and then down here we've got a bunch of genes that are not significant uh, with very low estimated selection coefficients, just to make that point. Uh, so generally speaking, the point here is just that we really need to continue to do this tumor sequencing and analyze and analyze, because we're gonna find these low frequency mutations that are of very, very high importance to particular patients and that can be very important because often these low free, because of the gene, because as I told you, the gene mutation rates vary a lot, even within like HPV plus and HPV minus uh, um, uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And between cancer types, they vary a lot. So when the mutation rates vary a lot, it may be that there's a high prevalence mutation in one cancer for which we develop a targeted drug. We may sequence someone with a totally different cancer and they may have this mutation, it may be at very low frequency in that cancer, and the common assumption on tumor boards that I've been to has been that, oh, it's at really low frequency, it's probably not that important. That's a really bad assumption to make. It may be extremely important to that individual patient. It may just be a, have a very, very low mutation rate, and so it doesn't actually contribute. So in that case, these are very important things to understand, even in clinical care right now in the hospital, because some of these decisions are being made. Okay, so the conclusions are be cautious with the overinterpretation of p-values or prevalence of mutation among tumors, and yes, I'm gonna get to your question. Uh, the ratio of the flux 
of actual substitutions. The flux of substitutions expected to occur by mutation and fixation in the absence selection is the cancer effect size. This ratio quantifies the relative effects of different mutations on the survival and proliferation of cancer cell lineages, providing a basis for many important projections of the evolution of cancer tumors. And the effect sizes of each alteration are of fundamental importance to oncology. And I I'm arguing, perhaps too strongly, but I believe it, with immediate revel relevance to ongoing decision making in precision medicine tumor boards, to the selection and design of clinical trials. We should choose to do the clinical trials towards the most F, you know, high selection efficient mutations, uh, to the targeted development of pharmaceuticals, which ones do we want to target? The ones that have high selective effect, and to basic research prioritization as well. Now to answer your question in like the minute that I have left, acknowledgements, I already told you that. This was funded by Gilead Sciences, this research. I'm going to skip past all of this, although I'd love to show it to you, just to point out that um, investigation of copy number variants is something I've been trying to work on. Uh, and we have an approach that's in, pr in prep for this, uh, but it's a lot harder. So um, I know uh, some of you have a lot of expertise in copy number analysis, and I would love to talk to you if you have some ideas. Of course, what we need to do this analysis is an idea of the baseline rate of copy number change. And if we can get that baseline rate, then everything else follows directly from it. And that's true not just for copy number analysis, but for fusions, everything else. If we can get the baseline rates, we can get the selection coefficients. So if anyone knows about baseline rates, please talk to me. Um, great, great talk. I was, I was just wondering, not related to copy number, but um, when you've been looking for the selection coefficients, because a key question has been, and I guess people have been surprised by lack of negative selection, do you see when you look at the, I mean, at the amino acid level, do you see any sort of events that you can clearly show are negatively selected that you'd miss at the gene level? Um, so I have thought just a little bit about that, and I, I'm not sure of what I'm about to say, but I think the case is that we're not able to see negative selection. The bottom line is that it's, you know, it, we're, we're breaking things down to the individual nucleotide, so what we really see is, I mean, in effect, there's a little bit of a bias to this approach that the selection coefficients are a little bit higher, and the reason is every single thing that we observe is actually there, but if you have a low mutation rate across many, 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 many sites, and that's why I've only talked about recurrent mutations. We have low mutation rate across many, many, many sites. Any site you see mutated is present more frequently than you expect, right? And it, this bias is not problematic when you have three or four mutations, but it's problematic to having, if you have one mutation, for instance, you get a selection coefficient, right? Just because it's, you, you know, what's the chance you had that particular mutation? It's really low, <laughs> right? So you, so you have to, so, uh, so the point is that what we're looking at is the over-representation, so we don't really have scope to figure out negative selection. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't sort of adapt this in some way, maybe on a gene-wide basis or something like that, to try to look at uh, negative selection, but um, at least I have not uh, done anything to look at that. Maybe one more question or two. Oh. <laughs> we'll come back to <laughs> How do you estimate these trinucleotide rates? They, they can change during tumor development, and they're tumor specific as well. Right, so uh, um, your talk showed that very nicely. <laughs> um, I just estimate them for the entirety of tumor initiation to resection, right? So, so it's, so it's going to be the average is what okay. we're going to be using. Um, and my claim would be that's basically fine because we're looking at the selection over the entire time anyway and the mutation, it's, it's all gonna work out okay, but what would be even better would be to segregate it into particular epochs <laughs> within the thing and look at the particular trinucleotide mutation rates in that epoch and the selection coefficients in that epoch, and then we would get a picture over time of how the selection coefficient changes, which would be a really, really cool thing. Oh good, let's talk. Quick question and comment on what you were asking about baseline rates. I, I, I think bring in the evidence for that because what you want isn't really the baseline rate of copy number aberrations because it's almost 
be the first mutation. What you would want is the baseline rate of copy number aberrations in TP53 damage. Uh, I see what you're saying. Your, um, if your point is that to know the baseline rate, you have to know the other genetic mutations, I completely agree. Um, if it's just whether we need that, I mean in general we don't need that, but yes, if P53 is changing the mutation rate, then it would be nice to have that. And that, by the way, has not been incorporated to any of these calculations um, in general, whether or not there were other mutations that are increasing the mutation rate in a particular case. Uh, in general, it doesn't make a big difference to this. I mean obviously it would improve it if we knew that, it would change things, but it would just tweak things a little bit because basically of the law of averages. The way it all works out, we're averaging across many tumors, the tumors have different mutation rates, et cetera, et cetera. In the, in the end, our selection coefficients are still um, an unbiased estimator for the selection coefficient on average across that time. It just would give us more precision if we took that into account. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, I can't do everything all at once. So I'm, I'm working on doing that too at the same time. Uh, Um, so, as we mentioned earlier, the epistatic interactions between these genes are very big and very important. Um, I've estimated those for some of these data sets. They're very big and very important. The average remains the average, but yeah. <laughs> 